Today is a short video introducing the concept of rotational inertia. So in the last video we talked about torque. How could we change the force so that we could effectively increase the rotational rate of objects? What we want to do today is to talk about how can we change the body itself in order to affect that rotational rate. And the first obvious thing is by changing the mass. It's like when we first studied Newton's first law. Objects with a lot of mass have a lot of inertia. Well, objects with a lot of mass are also going to be hard to rotate. They're going to have a lot of rotational inertia. So the first thing you've got to do is consider mass. So this door here, it's going to be hard to open simply because it's really massive. This second door here, it's also going to be hard to open. But in this case, it's because it's got a really big door handle here. And the door handle is a long way from the axis of rotation. So we've got a lot of mass situated a long way from the axis of rotation. And that's going to make it difficult to open that door. So it's not just about the mass, it's how far. How far is that mass located from the axis of rotation? If you weren't convinced by the door handle example, perhaps this example from Paul Hewitt is a little bit clearer. Suppose we want to rotate this ruler upwards with our hand. Then if we place the weight over here, it's going to be hard to rotate. But if we place the mass over here, it's going to be easier to rotate. So it doesn't depend just on how much mass we have. It also depends on where we place that mass. How far is it from the axis of rotation? So not so long ago, we talked about inertia and Newton's first law, etc. And we defined inertia as the ability of a body to resist changes in motion. And of course, another word for changes in motion is acceleration. Now we're talking about rotational inertia. This stuff that doesn't just depend on mass, but also depends on how far that mass is distributed from the axis of rotation. But it's defined the same way. We'd say it's the ability of a body to resist changes in rotational motion. And another name for changes in rotational motion would be angular acceleration. So in the same way that if there's no unbalanced force acting on an object, then it's going to then it's going to be a body that stays at rest if it is at rest, or it's going to be a body that stays at constant velocity if it's moving with some velocity. Similarly, if there's no unbalanced torque on a body, it will either stay not rotating, or if it is rotating, it will rotate at a constant angular velocity or we could just say constant spin rate or rotation rate. Tightrope walkers know a lot about rotational inertia. They don't carry that long stick just to show off. It's not like, hey, I can walk, chew bubble gum, and carry a long stick all at the same time. That's not what's happening. This stick, in fact, will be loaded with weights at the end. So those weights are going to be a long way from the axis of rotation. So if we think in terms of the system of the man plus the stick, that system has more rotational inertia. That means it's more stable. It's harder to rotate. And rotate is what the tightrope walker does not want to do. Because for him, rotation means falling off the rope onto the cement. We're going to have a little race. And what I'd like you to do is to predict the winner. Here's the conditions for the race. We've got a ring and we've got a disc, a solid disc. And they both got the same mass. They've also got the same radius. Start them from the top of an incline. Which one gets to the bottom first? Pause the video, make your prediction, and then stay tuned. That excerpt was from the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics. So of course the disk won. And the disk won because its mass is distributed more closely to the axis of rotation, the center of the disk. The ring has more rotational inertia. It's harder to make it increase its rate of rotation. 
and so it loses the race. You've probably been noticing that there's some parallels between linear motion and rotational motion. In linear motion, we've got force. For rotational motion, we've got torque. For linear motion, we've got mass or inertia. For rotational motion, we've got rotational inertia. We usually use a capital I for rotational inertia. And then for linear motion, we've got ordinary acceleration. And for rotational motion, we have what's called angular acceleration. And we usually give that a symbol alpha. Linear motion, we've got a relationship between force, mass, and acceleration. And that is that the sum of the forces, or the net force, or the resultant force, will equal the mass times the acceleration. Now what we can do is write that the sum of the torques, or resultant torque, will be equal to the rotational inertia times the angular acceleration. This rotational inertia will be a property of the body. And we're going to have to figure out how we can get some values for rotational inertia. This angular acceleration is going to be the rate at which the rate of rotation changes. Or we could say it's the rate at which the angular velocity changes. Now if we're going to do calculations using Newton's second law, we're going to need numerical values for the rotational inertia of a given body about a given axis. By the way, another term for rotational inertia is the moment of inertia. So if you hear that phrase, moment of inertia, it just means the same thing as rotational inertia. Now there's three different ways that we can go about finding the moment of inertia of a body about a given axis. Method one would be to use a table like the one that you see right here. And you'll get formulas like this. They'll always involve sort of a coefficient and the mass of the body and a characteristic length that gets squared. So that characteristic length might be the radius of a sphere. It could be the length of a stick, etc. And take note that the moment of inertia depends on what axis you choose. So the moment of inertia of a stick about the end is going to be larger than the moment of inertia of a stick about the middle. Second method you could use, you could, the second method you could use is calculus. Calculus would be used to derive all the formulas in your table. Uh, this isn't a calculus based course, so I'm not going to talk much about that. Third way, if you've got a very unsymmetrical body, you're not going to be able to look it up in a table. And so what you'd have to do is some sort of experiment where you'd measure the torque and the angular acceleration on the body and thereby determine the moment of inertia. So let's summarize very quickly this I. That stands for the rotational inertia, also called the moment of inertia. It's going to depend on the mass of the body but also the way in which that mass is distributed, and in particular, how far is the mass away from the rotational axis. And that's going to be represented in our equation as some characteristic length of the system squared and some coefficient out front here. And generally what you'd do is you'd, you'd look up that coefficient in a table. And what is rotational inertia? Well, it plays the role of inertia for rotating bodies. So it's the ability of a body to resist changes in rotational motion. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.